You're listening to the Critical Hour on Radio Sputnik. I'm Wilmer Leon. It's now being reported that the Niger coup leaders are going to put deposed president on trial for treason. That's a real blow to Victoria Newland's mission. For insight into this, let's turn to my next guest. He holds the John Jay and Rebecca Moore's Chair of History and African American Studies at the University of Houston. He's one of the most prolific writers of our time. His latest book is entitled Revolting Capital, Racism and Radicalism in Washington, D.C., 1900 to 2000. Dr. Gerald Horn, as always, sir, welcome back. Thank you for inviting me. So it's now being reported that Mohamed Bazoum, the deposed president of Niger, may face treason charges. The junta that unseated him last month announced making or I'm sorry, marking a new escalation in tensions with neighboring countries that are pondering military action against the leaders. A military intervention would put hundreds of Western soldiers, including U.S. and French troops who are based in Niger, to assist in combating regional militant groups at risk of being caught in the middle. Uh, Your thoughts, Dr. Horn, when you first heard what many would say is quite an escalation. Quite an escalation indeed. And I'm sure Washington has paid close attention to the fact that there have been raucous demonstrations in front of the French military base in Niger, none so far in front of the U.S. military base. And that may encourage the tendency already existent in Washington to try to do a number on its alleged ally in France by cutting some sort of deal with the new regime. In any case, Washington and France, which are encouraging an intervention by Nigeria and the economic community of West African states, which it leads, they may have overreached. And I say this because in Nigeria, as we speak, there is mounting criticism of President Tinubu, who, of course, has been rather vocal in terms of watch, uh, wishing for a military intervention. What has been resuscitated are these stories that are now front page news, and of course were front page news before he was inaugurated in late May 2023 about his nefarious connections when he was in the United States between 1977 or so and the mid-19 and the early 1990s when he fled. The story is that this apparent mild-mannered accountant was actually an accountant for drug dealers. In Chicago, of course, he attended Chicago State University, and the idea is that there was a kind of pan-African unity, but not the sort that Du Bois or Garvey would have hoped for. That is to say, Nigerians wholesaling drugs, hard drugs, heroin, not least, and being retailed by so-called street gangs, African Americans. Uh, That led to a number of trials. The ring was busted. Apparently, Mr. Tinubu fled in the early 1990s, leaving $500,000 on the table as a result of a so-called civil forfeiture. And this is now a matter of public concern in Nigeria. Actually, it could lead to his premature exit from the presidency. And I should also say that all of this loose talk about war in Niger is inflaming northern Nigeria, which is heavily dependent upon Niger for economic well-being. I don't see it as accidental that if you look at Nigerian media, disproportionately the critics of this proposed intervention are houses who are disproportionately cited amongst the border uh, with Niger, and of course there are houses across the border uh, as well. Uh, This is very ominous because we all know about the fissures and the Nigerian body politic and the real and imagined conflicts between and amongst houses and Igbos and Yorubas. And it's felt that all of this talk about a war in Niger is exacerbating that trend. And then there's the question of how and why it is that Washington and Paris are egging on Nigeria uh, to get 
and understanding, you may have to go back once again to the writings of W.E.B. Du Bois, who, during the midst of World War I, wrote one of the most, most famous essays. I'm speaking of African Roots of War, where he suggested that World War I was driven because the European powers, Germany not least, felt that they did not have enough African colonies, particularly to compare it to a relatively weak France. And I would dare say that the exploitation and plundering of Africa still makes it a target of opportunity for the imperialist camp. Witness France still has military bases in Africa. And then that leads to corrupting African leaders. Recall that it was in 1979 that then-President Giscard d'Estaing was driven out of office in a sense because it was revealed that he was receiving diamonds from the despotic tyrant Bokassa and the Central African Republic, diamonds illicitly. Recall that about a decade or so ago, when Libya was attacked, that was led or spearheaded within NATO by France under President Sarkozy as an attempt, it was said, to cover up the story that he was getting money under the table Mm -hmm. from Libyan sources. And so we still see that what Du Bois wrote more than a century ago uh, still has relevance, I'm afraid to say, and that argues, obviously, for a militant response on this side of the Atlantic uh, to this idea, uh, spearheaded by the State Department and Victoria Nuland, that there should be some sort of military intervention uh, in Niger, because this, if it were to occur, would not be the first time. Recall what happened about a decade or so ago, when there was an electoral dispute in Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast, just like there have been electoral disputes in the United States of America. But what happened in Cote d'Ivoire is that French paratroopers landed, they bundled up one of the candidates and shipped him off to the International Criminal Court in The Hague to stand trial and installed their policeman, President Wouterra, who of course now is cheerleading for a French intervention in Niger and has promised to contribute 850 troops. So once again, in order to preserve not only uh, peace and security on the African continent, but I would argue worldwide, uh, we have to drive the imperialists out of Africa because their presence there only stirs up a hornet's nest of controversy and conflict and that redounds to the detriment of Africans, not least. And two things. One, to your point about Tanubu. Uh, If you just Google Tanubu drug lord, you'll find all kinds of uh, headlines. Was Tanubu announced as a drug baron by different countries? That's from March of 2023. Uh, Tanubu bagman for Chicago cocaine mafia. That's from the Gazette uh, uh, four days ago. Bola Ahmed Tanubu from drug lord to president. That's from last year. So there are a lot of stories, and I'm, I'm just picking out a couple off the top. Tanubu finally defends his documented drug trafficking. So that's from Business Day. Uh, so there are a number of stories to that headline. You know, in listening to what you've just laid out, it, it just goes back to the, the inherent problems with the map that we consider to be the continent of Africa, how the lines— how the how the 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 borders have been artificially constructed, and the ongoing tensions that result from that, uh, because of the the structure of the societies on the continent, the tribal structure of the societies. And you made a point, and just really quickly, you made a point last week, and I, I can't remember who you were talking about, but you made a point. You said, just look at his nose. And I think that went by a lot of folks, but I think you were referring to what it is I'm just, I'm now asking about. Well, to be sure, and I should also say that apparently Washington is not releasing documents about the ill-gotten gains of President Tanubu, one of the richest men in the world, by the way, perhaps the richest president in the world as we speak, which is saying something. And that puts him in the camp, I'm afraid to say, of the former president of Panama, Manuel Noriega, who, as you know, was apparently implicated in drug dealing. And then Washington turned on him, invaded Panama, and drug him back to a prison cell in Florida. Now, 
I don't think that there is a chance that Washington will invade Nigeria in case Mr. Tanubu decides not to play ball. But obviously, they have the sword of Damocles hanging over his neck. If they release these documents to the journalists in Lagos who are clamoring for these documents about Mr. Tanubu, uh, it could be game over, game set match uh, for the current Nigerian president. And that would backfire tremendously uh, against Washington, which is probably one of the reasons why the documents won't be released. Because waiting in the wings are candidates for president who are much more progressive uh, than uh, Mr. Tinubu, just like uh, recall that when Giscard d'Estaing was driven out of office in late 1979 mm-hmm. because of his peccadilloes with the Central African Republic, replacing him was the socialist, Francois Mitterrand. So Washington has not learned the lesson. France has not learned the lesson. Uh, be careful how you deal in Africa, and better still, why don't you evacuate Africa altogether? And so it is possible, and I underscore possible, that not only could the West lose Niger, uh, the West could lose Nigeria, and if the West loses both, they're in deep, deep yogurt. <laughs> well, that's for sure. I should mention another point as well which uh, is in in accord with the themes we've been stressing today, which is there is a lot of concern in Nigeria about Boko Haram, the religious Mm -hmm. zealots who operate uh, in northern Nigeria who specialize in kidnapping teenage girls. Now, the story is now afloat in Nigeria that if you trace the origins of these religious zealots, it leads back to Saudi Arabia, the close ally of the United States. That would not be the first time we know that the Wahhabis of Saudi Arabia uh, helped to sponsor uh, a rather austere version uh, of Islam. And uh, the headline out of Nigeria is that if you want to understand uh, Islam, uh, particularly Boko Haram, uh, in northern Nigeria, the headline is from Sufi to Saudi. That is to say, before the Saudis intervened in Nigeria, there was a Sufi benign kind of Islam operating in northern Nigeria uh, and amongst Islam, uh, amongst Muslims generally. But after the Saudis got involved, then you have the rise of Boko Haram, this terrorism. Now you have uh, numerous Nigerian refugees who sought refuge across the border in Niger, which is a complicating factor in terms of a military intervention uh, because uh, it could lead to an end to Niger uh, accommodating itself uh, to Nigerian refugees or accommodating itself to Abuja in terms of fighting Boko Haram. We have just about a minute 45 left, and this is obviously an incredibly dynamic situation. It was reported earlier that Niger was giving a green light to start talks with ECOWAS, and then there's a counter story that's being reported that Niger refuses negotiations unless the coup leader is is recognized. Y- your thoughts on the dynamics here? Well, it's well known that if a coup is not dislodged within a day or two, it's appropriate to begin referring to it as the new regime. And I think that that's appropriate here. I should also say that the Nigerian military, they're no scrubs. <laughs> They've been trained to a fairly well by the United States and the French. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure that that's giving uh, ECOWAS uh, second thoughts about a mil- military intervention, not to mention, of course, they'll receive backup from Mali, from Burkina Faso, uh, perhaps even from Algeria, uh, which is adamantly opposed to a intervention by France or a sock puppet of France, which is the role of Nigeria. Uh, they're adamantly opposed to that. And this could set that part of Africa aflame, complicating the energy dreams uh, of the North Atlantic countries who are lusting after the natural gas and the oil and the uranium uh, of that part of Africa. So I would urge the State Department to tread carefully, to rein in the hotheads and turn to diplomacy. Because we know the United States uh, loves turmoil, the United States loves dissension, but this could be a conflagration that the United States cannot control. Five seconds. Not control indeed, which is one of the reasons we need folks in the streets in Washington, D.C. 
Dr. Gerald Horn, as always, thank you so much for your time. Greatly, greatly appreciate that analysis and look forward to having you back. Thank you.